Welcome to Christ the Center, your weekly conversation of Reformed theology. My name is Camden Busey, and I'm here at Grace Orthodox Presbyterian Church in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, uh, back for another episode, uh, and I'm delighted to be here uh, with two friends from the Presbytery. I want to introduce first, we'll introduce uh, Brian DeYoung, who's the pastor here at Grace OPC. And how long have you been here now, Brian? Um, this is 14 years. 14 so, years. Yep. Yep. Wonderful. Uh, it's it's. Thank you uh, for inviting us here and oh, yeah. having us, and it, it's great to have you on the program and talk oh, about it's some nice, stuff. Nice to be on the program. Yeah. And we also have Alan Strange. Uh, Alan, Dr. Alan Strange is not a stranger to the program. Uh, he was just on a few weeks ago to talk about his book, uh, Imputation of the Act of Obedience of Christ in the Westminster Standards, and uh, joins us again to, uh, to talk about church history. Welcome, Alan. It's good to see you. Thanks. Good to be here as always. It's always fun to be across the table from you. And we uh, What brings us here into Sheboygan and here at Grace OPC is the Reformation Day Conference, which uh, was kicked off this morning, uh, which is, uh, as far as uh, real time goes, this is Saturday, November 2nd, 2019. And uh, the conference will continue tomorrow with the morning and evening services and a Sunday school, uh, which which is on the theme as well. So Alan was the speaker. And uh, Brian, you've been organizing this conference for quite some time. How long? How far does it go back? Does, yeah, it, this does is, it precede you? No, this is yeah. our eleventh year. Wow! And uh, we we've tried to focus on different aspects of the Reformation. Mm-hmm. We've done some on the Dutch Reformation last year. Uh, we had Bill Edgar, and he talked about the French Reformation. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've covered the Westminster Assembly, um, Scotland, and Knox, and so we're just trying to kind of paint the whole picture of the Protestant Reformation and why it remains a very relevant thing for Christian thinking and Christian living today. Yeah, that's amazing. And next year, uh, you just announced you're having Danny Olinger to speak yes, about Yes, Danny Voss. Olinger is going to come and speak about Gerhardus Voss. And as I've been reading uh, his recent book on Voss, mm-hmm. it's just fascinating. Mm-hmm. And to have Hodge this year, Voss next year. I mean, mm-hmm. it's a, it's a doubleheader. It's it's going to be good. Princeton one two punch. Yeah, that's right. That's you right. have a song for You're that. You're trying <laughs> to turn everybody into post millennialists because <laughs> I mean, I, you don't get better than that. Hodge and Voss, and just to, I mean, I've uh, the upcoming journal in America, Journal of Theology. I have a review mm. of Danny's book, and it's I enjoyed it so much. I uh-huh. I, I read lots of books and review lots of books, uh-huh. but this was a book that I just it was like, you know, eating cake. I just yeah, so yeah. enjoyed it. Yeah. I so enjoyed reading it, and uh, I highly commend it to the readers. And yeah. uh, Danny, uh, my ten bucks. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. paid. Well, we're we're running out of them. I mean, we're going to have to th- okay. uh, po- possibly do a second print run. So mm. I believe we're under a hundred. Well, under fifty copies left. I'd have to go count. Wow. We got a handful of boxes, in, anywhere from fifty to a hundred left. And I did run a, a a sale not too long ago on some of those last mm. copies of the first print run. So, you know, Lord willing. Uh, I don't know by the end of the year if we'll sell out. Probably not because the sales have, have slowed down as yeah. normally happens with books. But it's a tremendous book, and we're we're just delighted that Danny w- went with us to get it printed at least. I know that he had serialized the book, but it's been revised a little bit, and and then to have it in one volume, yeah. uh, it, and he did such a fine job with it. So, and not just writing it, but editing it, and all. <laughs> I mean, yeah. It's really amazing how much he and Diane, his wife, worked on it. Well, one of the interesting things for me as I've been reading it is how it illuminates Dutch Calvinism. Uh And having grown up in the Christian Reformed Church and, you know, both sides of my family, Dutch Calvinists, it's really showing me aspects of my heritage that I didn't really understand. And, Mm -hmm. you know, seeing the the kind of cross-pollinization between like Voss and Bavink and, and seeing how he was such a central figure for so many people it, it is really fascinating mm-hmm. yeah it, it it is i mean he, uh danny's subtitle there emphasizes that that mm. point of, of voss that he's both you know confessional presbyterian and yeah. and uh as well as a reformed biblical theologian so mm. those 
two do not necessarily need to be at odds. They shouldn't be. They're they're harmonious. Yeah. Alan, you were speaking about that this morning to a degree about the three forms of unity in the Westminster Standards, and you're at an institution teaching where you subscribe to both, at least to the confession. Right. I always yeah. joke because the board handbook says only the Westminster Confession does not include the catechisms uh, in my handbook. So <laughs> anyway, um, th- those things do go together, yeah. and I think sometimes we it's important to understand the different traditions and the heritage and maybe some of the minor differences of emphases, but we're all, uh, you know, pulling in the same direction yeah. here and, and, and to, to artificially to divide the reformed and the Presbyterian side of things is, is very unhelpful and, yeah. and not, not, not too useful. I would, on that point, I'd be curious, uh, just what are your thoughts on that? Because eventually your father came into becoming an OPC minister, yeah. and now your son yep. is training for the gospel ministry yep. and has been licensed uh, to preach the gospel. So we're working on a third-generation OPC minister in the yep. family, correct? Yeah, building building some uh, momentum there. Mm-hmm. But you know, when, when I came into Presbyterianism, <clears throat> um, I had been raised— for the first 20 years of my life in the Christian Reformed Church. And that's all I knew. And when I went to Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, there was no CRC church within 200 miles. So I kind of flirted with a a Baptist church for a while until my dad told me, nope, you're going to the PCA church. Mm -hmm. And so then I came into the PCA church and I started really sinking my teeth into Presbyterianism. And what I found there was a lot of the richness of the Dutch Reformed perspective, but certain things that were an enhancement of it and things that I had never really heard about in my Dutch Reformed upbringing. For instance, the regulative principle of worship. Mm. And when I started to really explore this, I realized I've had a, a pretty good portion of the Reformed faith you know, handed to me by my parents and my church, but there's aspects of the Reformed faith that come more through Presbyterianism that I really have never really fully appreciated. Mm-hmm. And it, it became kind of a confluence of two streams, and I felt like, wow, I've got the best of both worlds because there's a lot of good in the Dutch Reformed world. But there's a lot of good in Presbyterianism, too. And when those two come together, there's a richness there, which is fascinating. I found, you know, I I have only been coming into contact with the continental tradition over the last several years, Mm -hmm. namely moving back to the Midwest. um, I grew up in a mainline Presbyterian church. It was a conservative one at that, but uh, nevertheless, mainline. Uh, wasn't catechized as a child. That wasn't something that our church or our family tradition did. But then when I went uh, off to Westminster, uh, you live in a Presbyterian bubble, so to speak. I mean, the closest URC church, if I'm not mistaken, is in New York City. Mm-hmm. And um, that's been tough for some of our URCNA brothers. I know uh, friends of mine, Sam Perez and, and uh, Dan Ragusa, you know, they they might go study at Westminster, but they don't have a place in in their own denomination to attend or federation to attend. Um, and of course, Dan did study <laughs> he did. first. He got his MDiv at Mid-America. <laughs> a- but, amen. Yes. But I recommended him to go hmm. for the PhD at yeah. Westminster. And he's a very capable student. But it's a, it can be uh, different. And so my, my point is, though, you know, all I ever knew was Presbyterianism. And then I find that, that having uh, the more ecumenical – uh, experience and contact with um, brothers of the same convictions and uh, in the in the same instincts, really, yet just coming from a different confessional tradition. Nevertheless, the same theological positions and whatnot has just enriched my my Christian life so much. And large largely that that not only is from the the CRC and URC influence in the Midwest, but also through my involvement in Mid America Reform Seminary. I I so much appreciate that to see both sides of, of things. And there, and I mean that in the way that there's not a division, but you know, there's a right. harmonious, you see kind of uh, two instantiations of, of a similar reformed conviction, reformation conviction here in the continental and in the, and in the Presbyterian side of things. And, and I think it's, it's helpful to remember the necessity for both. And what I mean by mm-hmm. that is I think sometimes people figure, well, 
the three forms are 16th century uh, with Dort being early 17th. Mm -hmm. And then you have more mid 17th century with Westminster. And so Westminster kind of, you know, takes up everything in those previous documents. Well, the foci, uh, the interests are a bit different. Mm -hmm. And you really still need them all. I mean, this morning I was highlighting, for example, and I do this with several things, but we could just take what I did in the conference, having to do with the Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. Belgic Confession 35, we do not have a, we, we, in my view, we can't dispense with that. And I, I'm happy to work in an institution where I get to, I, I both, it's required, but I get to mm -hmm. subscribe the three forms. Mm -hmm. I like to subscribe them. I want to, um, because there are things uh, that Belgic Confession 35 positively reflecting Calvin's, I think, very uh, beautifully developed view of the Eucharist mm. um, is there, and it's not reflected in the same way. Westminster doesn't doesn't contradict it or or in any way deny it, but Westminster very much has a, a an interest in distinguishing a proper view because because coming out of the English Church, there was still a lot of uh, Roman Catholic kind of sympathies. So there, the the Presbyterians are wanting over against the Anglicans to make really clear that we're not Roman Catholic in our doctrine. Whereas, as I said, the, the Belgic is very much coming off the Gallican Confession, which is just sort of pure Calvin. But it's, it's, we really need both of the traditions. And you look at a question like one in Heidelberg, well, there's nothing quite like that anywhere. Our question 60, which is how are we righteous before God? And there's, again, it's as fine an example of that. But I like to hear from somebody like Bob Godfrey, who comes from that tradition, then say things about Westminster, larger catechism, for example, 77, which distinguishes justification and sanctification. And he says, this is the best question on this sort of thing anywhere. This is the heart of the Reformation. And I think he's right. Mm. I guess it's all to say, I think the two, the two traditions need each other. I yeah, really do. Yeah, and yeah. I, I think it's, I, I believe that there is an imperative. I've been blessed, blessed to work since 1998 on the board of Great Commission Publications, which is our joint venture with the PCA. Oh, but the OPC. The OPC just to, and the PCA. Know, right. mm. But then I've been working uh, for, for a, a decade uh, almost uh, OPC and URC, mm -hmm. uh, particularly on the book that we produce, the Trinity Psalter Hymnal, and that's been just such a great blessing. And I think, I think we need, as particularly as the times grow worse, as the culture darkens, we need more and more working together because the culture doesn't distinguish. You know, if the, the culture was dealing with, if the broader society were dealing with a URC person right. and an OPC, right. if I could be blunt about it, they would shoot either one of us <laughs> because they wouldn't distinguish us. Yeah. To them, yeah. we're the same. Yeah. And we do have these differences, and I'm not saying the differences are inconsequential, and you don't have to work out polity differences. Yeah, that's I think the big they're one. chiefly. Yeah. But I think I, I think there's an ecumenical imperative. I don't know if this was where this conversation was meaning to go. Well, that's but, where we are now. <laughs> well, but, but I just I really do think there is yeah. such, and I and I think it's it's where we need. I think those that are really confessional, from that from the continental tradition and the Scottish British American tradition, need to we need to work together yeah. more and more, mm -hmm. uh, because, and if I can say this, if somebody's confessional in another tradition, I have more in common with them than I do somebody who, in my own tradition, who may not be really very confessional. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I think this <laughs> th this raises an, an interesting point, and um, Brian, I want to hear about your background and, and some of your current work, not only here at, at Grace, but also in the denomination, but just to set the table a little bit. Um, it's interesting to think about the two traditions, especially with these two specific denominations slash federations with the OPC and the URCNA. And some of the polity differences can be, and the things we find in books of church order, can be reinforced by institutional history. So we want to talk today about church history and the, and the effect of it upon the life of the church, and, and not just its effect, but also its importance, why it's important 
to know the history of the church in order to be really a faithful Christian and to, to not make the mistakes of the past, for example. But just to, to raise one illustration, um, and please, Alan, add your insights because you have much more experience in history with your CNA brothers. But, you know, there, there, there tends to be sometimes a, a general suspicion of general assemblies and those types of things. So we find in the URCNA, there, there often is this insistence on calling the denomination a federation. It's a federation of churches. Now, I know there's a range of views within the, within the URC, so not everyone's the same, but because of what went so wrong in the Christian Reformed Church and some of the bureaucracies and other issues and the, the, the way that power was wielded at the denominational level, there can be a, a reaction to that and a suspicion of a centralization of, of government or, or efforts. And whereas we see that the General Assembly can be very helpful on certain things like Christian ed or especially with missions, foreign missions, in terms of organizing efforts and going out there, the URCNA brothers can, can see that there are some advantages, but there, there's a reason why they, they might not just jump on board with those types of things because of the past and a past that we don't share. Of course, the, the mainline Presbyterian Church has its history of, of right. uh, bureaucracy, and, 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 but it, our, our beginnings and whatnot are, are a bit different here. And, but we, and yeah. with respect to the beginnings, yeah. we have done, and I could point those out in very specific ways, we have done very specific sorts of things, even in our judicatory. For example, the refusal for many, many years in the General Assembly to, for anyone to move the previous question, which is to end You're debate. Right. Right. And other people would come in and say, well, why, you know, and it had to do with the fact of the way right. Machen's trial was conducted and his defense was cut off at the knees. Right. And so we said, we don't want to end debate. And and and, and whether you agree with that or not, right. it's it's helpful. You need to appreciate some of that. So it's we need custom. to appreciate right. Right. our Continental brother, what they went through. They did go through Senate abuse. Yes. So yeah. it's sort of like, you know, I came up with a certain kind of fundamentalism and that certain Bible verses, I could hear verses read and I would almost wince. And, you know, when I was coming into the reform world, people were like, what's, what's wrong? You okay? Because it's this Bible verse had been misused. The Bible verse had been used by, by church authorities to kind of beat you over the head with. Mm. And so it wasn't that I, I mean, so you've got a problem with the Bible. Somebody said, well, no, I don't. I don't. It's God's word. I have a problem with how some people have used it. Yeah. yeah. And so I, I, you know, and I think our brethren need to be sympathized with and said, you know, they don't really want inefficient church government that doesn't work well. And I think they're, I think they're coming more to, I think they're coming around. We've had a lot of consultation with them. They've had a lot of consultation with us. Sure. And I know a number, Mark Bube has done extensive consultation, and they've really appreciated that and have benefited. Yeah. And they've, they've put in place some structures in the last, you know, decade that mm. they would have never in the first years done. But they've come to see, okay, well, there's some things that we can do that may appear to be more centralized than we earlier would have been comfortable with, mm-hmm. but it helps. But it takes time. Of course. And, and it's, the, you ta- it's, it's, it's with 23? taken us, I mean, only now mm-hmm. at certain general assemblies will on certain questions. Now, you, you, the previous question does sometimes carry. But it, when I first, when I was first going to general assembly, I'm coming up to, I'm almost at my 30th in a row. Uh, <laughs> but when I first started going, um, the previous question did you not carry. Right. Didn't it, it didn't carry. And I joined right in as I understood the reasons. And so I always voted against it, right. even when I thought we really should vote. <laughs> right. Right. Mm. It's just there something was a we tradition, don't do. just tradition that was right. OPC and there are yeah. traditions that are URC. And, and you you want to respect that. One of the problems, this is another matter. But mm-hmm. in recent years, you know, you think of movements like Federal Vision and we can name others. It isn't that the Federal Vision men a lot of times, the, at least what they recognize as problems, that these are problems. They recognize a weakness in the doctrine of the church, doctrine of the covenant. But the solutions were sometimes you had the feeling of people who just showed up at the party and they said, here's what's wrong with the Reformed church. You need to fix it. Well, you just showed up at the party. Maybe you should be quiet for a while and try to figure out sort of the shape. Maybe it's not exactly as you think it is. And you need to kind of figure this out. 
Yeah. You know, it's like sometimes people read Van Til and they don't really get him. But yeah. They jump to criticize him and you think, um, <laughs> you know. It can happen. Were you yeah. <laughs> jumping in? Yeah, well, they, we, we all learn things like that in life where we jump into conversations that we don't know the context or the background and we think we've got a word to say. And maybe maybe it's not the right word because we don't understand. But, you know, here's here's a, a difference between the OPC and the URC. And I think it's it's a function of age to some extent. Mm. In the OPC, there are still some people around, very few, but some, that were there in 1936 mm-hmm. who still remember those struggles and those fights, and it galvanized them. The URC, that struggle is much more recent. Mm-hmm. And when I go to a URC church... I get immediate access because I've got a Dutch last name. And that creates an instantaneous bond, and we begin playing Dutch bingo to find out who knows who. But there's also a sense that I remember from my childhood and my teenage years the struggle going on between the conservatives and the CRC. I remember the issues. I remember the debates partially because my father was deeply involved in a lot of those things. And when you've been through a struggle with another group of people, you're bonded to each other Mm. in a way that causes you to love and appreciate each other, even though you may have some disagreements. Now, as the OPC gets further and further away from our founding, that bond is somehow changing, I Mm. think. And, you know, new people come in, who, who knew not Joseph. Mm-hmm. And there's still fellowship, but there's a different quality to the bond that connects us because we haven't been through the struggle. Right. We haven't faced you know, the theological enemies that were trying to uh, rule us out of order. And it, it's kind of going to be a new experience for the OPC mm-hmm. as the last of those surviving original members are gone. And all we've got left is the memory of that. Mm-hmm. Having the memory is good, but having the experience is different. Now, everyone ought to know uh, Dr. Strange is is a, a tremendous historian, written several books. I mean, we've talked about the book on the act of obedience of Christ, but his dissertation is also on the table because it's a subject of discussion at this conference, The Doctrine of the Spirituality of the Church and the Ecclesiology of Charles Hodge. But um, to get back to your point, Brian, I, w- I would like people, I would like for you to speak about your denominational involvement and, and Presbyterian involvement. Yeah. You're an archivist of the Presbytery. You're on the committee of the, for the historian. But the OPC does a tremendous uh, amount of work and is very good at cultivating its its heritage and its traditions and its history in writings, in lectures, and in, in various forms. But as as we have more and more members who knew not Machen personally, and we become older uh, as a denomination and further removed from some of those originating struggles, you're right. How do we come to know these things? And a lot of it is a is a bond that's developed through a shared narrative yeah, and yeah. stories. And and it'd be useful, I think, for our listeners to hear about some of the work you've been doing and the denomination does to cultivate some of those shared stories to keep us, you know, on point and, and to remember the past. Well, can I tell a story? Please. Okay. Well, that seems fitting for it. <laughs> that's story. right. That's right. <laughs> so I, I was somewhat new to the Presbytery of the Midwest, and I noticed that we did not have an archivist. So every meeting on our papers, the archivist spot was blank. And I started thinking about that. I thought, I, I would kind of like to do that. So I stood up at one point, and I think Alan was was actually reporting for a committee, and I said, wouldn't it behoove us to have an archivist? And Alan turned around and pointed me and said, you got the job. (laughs) And I have been serving as the Presbytery historian and archivist for the Presbytery of the Midwest uh, for a good number of years now. I love it. I love the story of our presbytery, partially because it goes back to the 1930s and the founding uh, of our presbytery. Uh, Arthur Perkins, who was our first moderator, is a fascinating man who served the Lord and who died 
basically of exhaustion. Uh, in the chair? No, no not in okay. the chair. Oh, what a way to go. But I want to die <laughs> preaching. My <laughs> wife's like, don't talk like that. I want to preach a sermon yeah. and finish, say <laughs> amen, and fall over yeah, dead. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but he died I, right I before. Want to somebody out of order. He, he died right before Machen did. And so his his funeral was, oh, wow. I believe, before the Machen. weekend before Machen died. No. Yeah. The end of 36. Yeah, yeah. The end of, it was like the 29th of hmm. December. Hmm. But you, you hear his story. And he was canvassing the state of Wisconsin with the gospel mm. and was so zealous and got so much pushback from the PCUSA. <laughs> and, you know, you start to dig into the stories of the history of this presbytery. It, it's just a gold mine mm-hmm. of information. So then I was at a general assembly, and there was an opening on the committee for the historian, and I was nominated and uh, elected and I've been serving on that. I think this is my third term now. And again, it, it's a bigger uh, venue, so to speak. It's looking at the whole denomination, not just the Presbytery of the Midwest. But we take seriously our history yeah. and documenting it. So one of the things that I've been quite involved in recently is doing oral history interviews. In fact, at General Assembly, we did six of these. And then when I was on vacation this summer in Maine, I got together with Steve and Ann McDonald and did an oral history with them. And then I met with Steve's brother, Paul, who had served on the Christian Ed Committee for decades. And just hearing these elderly saints telling the story of the early years and how the Lord used their churches and their pastors and the presbytery it just fills you with a sense of appreciation for those people who have gone before us, who have suffered, really, for the sake of the gospel, and who really were devoted to Christ in a way that kind of puts a lot of us to shame, yeah. I think. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and to have that not only on record, but then also, yeah. you know, it's one thing to record it and just stuff it away, and if some scholar wants it, yeah. they can go find it. But um, to to spread that and uh, among our people, not just the ministers and not yeah. not just the elders and deacons, but to to all of our people, there there's a tremendous awareness. I'm always surprised. I was just hearing you having conversations, Alan, with with some people they were visiting, and they're just today uh, to this conference, and the the general awareness of OPC history is is very strong among many of the people. Yeah. Not saying it's there for everybody, but. Uh, I'm I'm frequently surprised at how well many of our our church members know our our shared ecclesiastical history. It's but encouraging. You know, what I'm c- concerned about, and I've thought about this quite a bit, is the millennial generation. Mm. You know, my kids' generation. Are they not only hearing the stories, but connecting the dots? And if they don't really come to understand our rich history they're not going to fully appreciate our heritage. So I've got a parable. <laughs> Can I do a parable? Yeah. Parables always you know, fall short at some point. This is not an allegory. But uh, I, I think of a, a young person, maybe 23, 24, who went to school, got a degree, uh, racked up maybe $60,000 in college debt, and they got out and they got an entry-level job. Yeah. And they're making okay money, and they're able to pay their school loans, and they're living okay. It's, it's not a horrible life, but they're not high on the hog by any means. Mm-hmm. Well, unbeknownst to this person, their great-great-grandfather was a lumber baron and amassed an incredible fortune in the lumber business. And that fortune, all that money, has been put on deposit in a bank and every single one of his descendants has been made, uh, has been put on the account, can withdraw from the account. But because our young college graduate never heard about great great grandpa and didn't know about that fortune on deposit, he's never been able to draw off that fortune, that heritage that's his. And maybe it's because his parents just stop telling the stories of great-grandpa and his fortune in lumber. But if you've got 
people, you know, Christian people who are in Christ and who are complete in Christ, but they don't fully understand their history. They maybe don't really appreciate their heritage. And while they could have so much more, they don't know it's even there to access it. And so I think we have, we're talking about moral imperatives, we have a moral imperative to tell the next generation about the things of the Lord and about our Reformed faith and our Reformed world and life view, all of the rich heritage. I mean, Charles Hodge. Mm -hmm. And help them to understand that they've got this enormous treasury of richness that's theirs, and they can access it, and they can use it. And, you know, they're living okay now, but how much more could they enjoy if they really appreciated the full scope of their heritage? And if we don't get that message to this next generation, if they go into their years of maturity as the next generation of leaders and they don't know our history and they don't appreciate our heritage, I think it's just got to impact them in some ways. And it's got to change the way they view the church as opposed to the way it's been viewed in, in past generations. So I think you know our committee, the Committee for the Historian, has, has a real duty to get this message out in a way that is accessible to a younger generation. Mm -hmm. And a younger generation that maybe isn't so inclined to sit down and read a 400-page book as they are to maybe watch a 10-minute video. So we're kind of thinking about this. How do we take all that we have and make sure they can get it and assimilate it and begin to live off of our capital? Yeah. Alan, I'm curious how you approach. I've, I've seen you do it, and I understand that you do it, but I'm, I'm curious about you articulating your, your thoughts and your pedagogy regarding church history in the seminary classroom, because we're training men for gospel ministry. And clearly, uh, you know, church history is not just imparting a bunch of historical facts and, and just, you know, filling people's brains so that they might have data, or data in their head. Uh, but you're actually not only telling a story, but doing that with, a, with an interest for their souls <laughs> and also for equipping these people so that they can care for the for the for the flock in years to come uh, how how do you approach that task and what are the what are the kinds of things that you think about in terms of preparing lectures and delivering them you know looking at a more holistic view right. and, and spiritual well, formation in the midst it, of church it's, history it's a big task mm -hmm. um I, I often joke with my colleagues that they have rather more circumscribed tasks. They have the Old Testament or the New Testament or even systematic theology. When you have church history, you really have everything from 95 A.D. up to the present, in a sense. Uh, and so you have to pick and choose a lot. You, you, you've got to decide what's important because you don't want it to be a course in historical trivia uh, nor a course in, uh, you know, uh, stitch together anecdotes from church history, uh, but what you I think what I what I try to do is to go to give a cohesive, coherent narrative that tells the story. I mean, we the, we 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 have a story that we can tell cohesively and coherently. You mentioned Voss in terms of redemptive history, and it's but here's the text in the Bible. Now we don't have a similar text. For church history, we have lots of primary sources mm -hmm. and lots of secondary interpretations. Mm -hmm. And what I try to do is to take a reasonable read of what are arguably the more important sources because you're looking at what are the issues as you filter them out. You have to use discernment. You have to have good judgment. What are the and there are a number of things that point out, I mean, in the early church, what the first four councils deal with are obviously important things. There are a number of, of indicators and bellwethers of what's important. But you look at um, what, are the, what are the issues and how are they dealt with in the primary sources, and then how have the secondary sources dealt with them. And, and the secondary sources are going to vary from 
uh, sources closer to the time, whether it's the ancient church, a medieval church, or reformational church, sources that are closer to the time that are faith sources, or maybe co- maybe they're contravening faith sources. Maybe it's a Protestant view of this, it's a Catholic view of this. But then particularly since the Enlightenment and really what we've witnessed in our own culture and in the West in general, the secularization of all the disciplines, you, you have a whole other view that I very much take into account uh, a host of, of, of views that you could just call unbelief, an unbelieving approach with different aspects to it, which means then that, that, that teaching history takes on also a polemical or an apologetical task, right. which I'm not averse to do. No, so I did that in here today, for example. Yeah, right. I mentioned the importance of knowing the early church sources and having a sound interpretation of them over against a Dan Brown, not not just over against what what other religionists in broader Christianity may be saying, what Eastern Orthodox or Roman Catholic, but what is what is a secularist saying? And they're saying things like, well, the Gospel of Thomas, this was this was suppressed, but this is the real story of Jesus. Or you know, Jesus and Mary had the, Mary Magdalene had this you know, like Dan Brown and all these others. So. Partly, I mean, here's here's the the ministerial use. You need to know from the best sources and the better interpretations the history of the church. What has been our story? And the question Moises Silva raised in a book years ago: Has the church misread the Bible? Well, of course, you're going to have to define what you mean by church, right? <laughs> but we would say God's people in the main have not because the same spirit who inspired the prophets and apostles has illumined the church to receive that word and to give expression in the ecumenical creeds and then in the reformed confessions and catechisms of what does God's word mean. So what we see throughout the history of the church is there's certainly historical theology. There's more than that, but there's not less than that. And there's, there's that coming to understand that. And, and I teach my, my men in class that if we don't know, in terms of the history of the church, if we don't know where we've come from, we don't know where we are. And we have no real sense of where we're going. And I said, no, I said just because you know church history well won't necessarily make you a visionary. But there's no visionary. There's mm-hmm. nobody who has... Uh, a reasonable view of where we may be going and, and how things are leading, who doesn't understand where we're come from and, and where we are. I mean, those who, who have a view that's about the last five minutes, so to speak, are of very little use. So we need, to, there's, there's so many reasons why we need to know church history. And one of them is we need to know how we've read the Bible. What has the history of interpretation been? Mm -hmm. How have we read it? And we don't take the very naive and foolish view of an Alexander Campbell who says, I wish to read the Bible as if no one has ever read it before. Uh, Well, there is a value in reading the Bible with fresh eyes, but we don't read it as if no one has ever read it before because our brothers and sisters have read it before, and we don't ignore that. And the Holy Spirit wasn't only given to one person. (laughs) And everything we do is on the shoulder of giants in that sense. Everything we do, we're going forward. There's a forward progress Mm -hmm. in the church so that, you you, again, you mentioned Voss. Uh, Well, I said in the conference how Calvin was the theologian of the Holy Spirit. Calvin captured some things about the work of the Holy Spirit that hadn't been as clearly captured before. And then we talked about how Hodge captured some things, even about the proper roles of church and state. And we could say Voss captured, again, some things in terms of he took, think about what Voss did. Voss took what originally had been in the rise of biblical theology in in the time of the pietists um, as a liberalizing technique. In other words, biblical theology was originally developed specifically over against systematic theology. and But Gerhardus Voss didn't have that opposition. No, Gerhardus no. Voss believed in an organic unity of the whole Bible and of truth. But he said, well, can't we do a right? To, you know, while, we, while we, we're concerned about the product of unbelieving biblical theology, maybe we can take something of their method and do something really good with it. 
and have have a correct and true biblical theology that isn't at odds with systematics, but is works hand in glove mm. with systematics and is supportive of systematics. Mm. And biblical and, and systematics are friends. So right there, his Voss, and he wasn't the only one, but he's a significant figure to try to bring what had been an antagonism right. <laughs> into friendship right. to the benefit of of uh, of us all. I mean, that's just like, and, and something may have been used. I mean, somebody may have said worldview, and they may have meant it in, in a way that was inimical to the truth, but that mm-hmm. doesn't mean that we can't rightly use and appropriate some of this terminology. We do this all the time. Mm-hmm. We appropriate terminology. We may say, oh, this comes from Immanuel Kant, or this comes from Hegel, or this, but that doesn't mean that there's no value to it. This, they may have had an insight here or there. We believe in common grace and the antithesis. Mm. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, Brian, on, on, on this point, I'm also uh, interested to hear how this changes or how how your view of ministry and, and shepherding is informed by this desire also to cultivate these lessons among your people. So we've, we've heard a bit, and, and it's tremendous to hear how that works out in the seminary environment. Yeah. But in terms of you know Christian education and preaching and counseling, yeah. how does church history come into view there? How does that inform? And obviously, it's not, your, it's not our sole principium. That's, that's yeah, God's yeah, word. And, yeah. and, but my, my idea, though, or my thought here is that if these are important lessons to inculcate, certainly there are ways to integrate these lessons and these histories yeah. in a variety of formats. Yeah. Well, I'll give a, a real practical example um, just recently. Um, there, there's a pastoral problem I'm aware of, and uh, it's something that I feel like uh, I need to address, but I'm not sure exactly how to address mm-hmm. it. So I got a request, this came oh, six months, maybe a year ago, from someone, would you please go into the Presbytery archives and find a baptismal record for my daughter who is baptized in one of our churches, which then disbanded. So since we have the Presbytery archives, I went back and I started looking through minute books. I found the minute book. And I started reading through the minutes of this session trying to find this baptismal record. Well, in the reading of those minutes, I came across two instances where that session had dealt with a problem similar to the one that I'm wrestling with. And I got to basically look over their shoulder and see what they did, and then in subsequent meetings, what the results were. Mm. It was very informative, and and I think the Lord really used it to give me a kind of a kick in the pants. Look at this session and how they handled uh, an analogous situation. Now, how are you going to handle the situation you face? And so I think studying the history of the church can help you understand what have our forefathers done, how has it turned out, and where have they made mistakes? Where have they done some really excellent work? And that can kind of instruct and inform. So that's one way. Um, another way, and this is maybe more of a broad uh, response ba- based on something Alan said, I- I'm really fascinated with the idea of the historical narrative, partially because so much of Scripture is stories history, narrative. And so on our Wednesday evenings, we're studying through uh, the kings of Judah. That's our study. And we just have gotten into Jehoshaphat. And we're learning about Jehoshaphat's wonderful qualities and then his terrible weaknesses. He keeps on getting entangled with Ahab. And you think, Jehoshaphat, you're such a great godly leader of a king how can you have such a blind spot for Ahab and Ahab's influences? And at one point, Ahab just basically hangs Jehoshaphat out to dry. You go out in the chariot dressed like a king, and I'm going to hide here dressed like a common soldier. So if there's arrows pointed at a king, you're going to take the arrows, Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat blithely goes riding out there. And then the armies of Israel see him, and they say, there's Ahab, let's go get him. And they chase him. 
and he sees he's getting chased and he cries out to the Lord and the Lord rescues him. And in thinking about that and talking in our Bible study about this, we, we kind of came to a, a conclusion. You know, we like Jehoshaphat can have Achilles heels, things that are blind spots we don't see in ourselves. And their weaknesses, which are very inconsistent with the grace of God that's been working in our lives. And I am fully convinced I can make even stupider decisions than Jehoshaphat did. But I also know God is so very gracious, and he will come riding to my rescue when I make the kind of blunders that I'm prone to make. And I think our people really resonated with that. And they saw, you know, God is merciful in the face of our weakness. And it really connected with the people. So in teaching, you know, the stories of Scripture, and, and you know, not in a, a moralistic way. Mm-hmm. In, he in was a, delivered, and that arrow still found Ahab. Is, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and Ahab's, you know, off there thinking, I've escaped it. And all of a sudden, twang, off goes an arrow. And it strikes him in the joint of his armor, yeah. and he bleeds to death. And, and you know, you, you start to, and you engage people. And scripture starts to come alive to people. And it's not just, you know, didactic lessons of conceptual ideas, but it's the real life story of God and his people and his grace and mercy. And when people start getting excited about the scriptures like that, I think wonderful things begin taking root. You know, to go back to this idea of narrative, and and this is kind of a a little bit of a playoff, Richard Pratt's book, he gave us stories. God has constructed us as people who love stories. And that's seen at every movie theater where people crowd and pay money to watch stories. And it's the reason that novels are just so engaging to people because God made us as people who really resonate with narrative. You know, he could have just downloaded uh, abstracts of systematic theology to us. But instead, I mean, even the story of Christ, you engage in his, his life, his ministry, his temptation with Satan in the wilderness, you know, his dealings with the disciples and, you know, all the ups and downs with Peter. And you start to get really invested in the story and it captures your imagination. And, and that, that sense of the imagination being engaged with the, the truth of God's word is just, uh, there's something profound there that I can't even get my fingers on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there really is. It is a way that we're made uh, to, to transmit stories, but to receive them. Some people seem to have the gift better of remembering stories. Yeah. I've heard. So I always need whenever we hang out with our mutual friend Danny Olinger, I need to. He's told me the same story probably four times, and I'm learning new things every time. It's just because I don't remember them. But other people like Danny he has almost a superhuman capacity to remember some of those, yeah. some of those names and dates and and what that meant. It's a it's a tremendous thing. Um, you know, there was there was a interview that I listened to where. And I think this was on Mars Hill Audio with Ken Myers. Yeah, that's a great program. Where he was talking about how we love to listen to stories we know. Uh. And I've got a, a an annual tradition. In December, when it's getting cold and nasty out, I start listening to my audio books of The Lord of the Rings. Uh-huh. And I've done this like five or six or seven years in a row. And I know The Lord of the Rings pretty well but I love to listen to it. And the point Ken Myers was bringing out is that as we listen to stories we know, it allows us to draw out levels of meaning mm-hmm. that we don't get on the first run through. And that's true with Scripture too. This is why we keep reading the Bible. You I know, know yeah. <laughs> I mean, how many times haven't we read the creation account? Or how many times haven't we read you know, the Mount of Transfiguration or, or you know, any one of these? And yet every time through... God is bringing new things out for our appreciation. Well, and it's funny, too. It, 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 we can take real encouragement from that, Brian, in training our children because we have a tradition uh, on, on Christmas Day 
um, we, we tend to on Christmas Eve give the gifts and everything. We have like a, a, a lessons and carol service and we give the gifts. And then uh, Christmas Day, we have the, the dinner. And there in the afternoon, we all it's, you know, as it's getting dark and you put candles on and, and, and um, we listen to Dylan Thomas mm. read A Child's Christmas in Wales. Mm. And I remember when they, we started that, and there were other aspects. And when the kids were really little, well, they they didn't have to be talked into liking the gift gift. They liked yeah. that. Yeah. Everybody <laughs> presents, always presents more liked presents. The gift exchange. But when they were little, oh, the Dylan Thomas thing, because you know, here's this guy, and it's 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 prose, but it's mm. very poetical prose. Mm. And it's Dylan Thomas himself reading it, and it's just so beautifully done. And it's 19 minutes. Mm. It's not excessive, but now they're the youngest of our kids is 22 and if i were to say on christmas we're not going to listen to child's christmas i'd have a riot <laughs> i mean it's not exactly rocky horror picture show mouthing everything but they know what he's going to say yeah, yeah. and they anticipate it and they're so delighted in it yeah. and i saw over the course of years how they went from being kids you had to you know i mean we do this with devotions and everything but there's a particular thing that we've done that same thing yeah. for many years and you just see the delight that has come to be and they and now as they got married and two of them are married about another one is engaging going to be married mm. and their fiancés and then their spouses and then they're explaining to them this is what we do and this is this very important yeah. and i hear yeah. you know and, and it's and everybody's just you know delighted and now everybody can you know have a glass of wine everybody's <laughs> of age and and you're sitting around and you're it's just we just love it, and uh -huh. it's, yeah. it's it, we've never enjoyed it more. And I'm looking forward to the grandkids getting yeah. into it, yeah. and you know, and it's just mm -hmm. because it it is. Are, are you familiar with it? No, yeah, no, I'm not. I'm going to be. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. There's a shared enjoyment yeah. from yeah. having those common experiences, and whether it's listening to an audio book or reading out loud or whatever it is, you share those stories. And you can relate to each other. We used to take audiobooks uh, when we'd take long trips out west. And we listened to this audiobook called The Big Burn about the great fire out in Montana. I mean, it just scorched the whole west. And it told a lot of the stories of the firefighters who fought the blaze, some of them who died in the blaze. And it was so interesting listening to this as a family, as we're driving through the west, it just kind of came home to all of us and we felt like we have something in common that we've all experienced yeah. kind of vicariously yeah but still it's it's part of our shared experience yeah you became part of you and you yeah. became part of it yeah. woven into it the yeah. fabric of it oh that's and, and then thing. this is and of course there's been a lot of stuff written about this and the very fine book another book mm -hmm. that i uh, had a fairly lengthy review of in ordained servant uh, and I'm sure a friend, we could say, of Reform Forum, Dr. Eric Watkins, mm -hmm. his excellent book, The Drama of Preaching. Mm -hmm. And he talks about, there's an aspect of this, but, but that's a, if you want to know about this, the reality of this in preaching, yeah. I, it's a very fine book. And somebody who it comes from a very Vossian, mm -hmm. redemptive historical, biblical, mm. theological yeah. point of view, the drama of preaching. I'll mm. try to link to that. I, uh, Jim Cassidy uh, stepped in for me. Uh, the, I think he was at a home missions committee meeting, so the, I wasn't present, but they recorded a conversation on that mm. where Eric was able to speak about that book. So I'll dig that Good. up out of the archives and, and share that again for people who may have missed it or people who want to hear the yeah. story again. Yeah. And $10 drop. from you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there was, there was a sermon that I preached out of, uh, I think it was Matthew 7, the two roads, mm -hmm. the, the broad road leading to destruction and the, the narrow road leading to life. And as I was studying the text, I got the idea to preach the whole sermon as if I was a tour guide and the congregation was my tour group. And I was pointing out to them these two roads and various aspects and components of these two roads and where they lead. And I kept it in character for the whole sermon. It was the most enjoyable sermon I think I've ever preached. <laughs> and 
For you or them or both? <laughs> both, <laughs> both. And, and it was like we were standing there on a hill together, and I was saying, look over there and look at that and think about that. Oh, but then look over there and see that over there too. Did you see that? And, and it was like almost a narrative dramatic sermon experience. And I've never done anything like it before or since, but mm. it, was, it was just so mm. interesting to kind of mm. almost walk yeah. into the text as if you're a, a character in the text. Yeah. Well, that's why I think it's important too, and we, we've taught this at the seminary when we teach sermon types and talk about sermon types, that there is... You know, we have a, a preferred method in terms of uh, how we understand the text, and that you 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 understand a, a theme in the pericope, yeah. and you develop it in points. And normally, you were talking about this in our chapel yourself yeah. yesterday, and you you normally ad, 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 ad say these things up front. And I do that customarily. I yeah. will do that in my preaching here tomorrow. Yeah. But there's a narrative way of preaching that you've got to know how to do it well, yeah. and not everybody yeah. does. But Somebody who could do this really well, and I learned a lot from him about it, was Raymond Dillard. Now, he was mm. an Old Testament scholar, but in the classroom, he was, he was a master of drama in the classroom. Mm. Mm. Really? He, would, he would present a problem in the text. He would, de- he would describe a text. It could be a, a, a narrative, or it could be, a pro- it could be a, one of the prophets, and he would show you the problem, and it almost like you're ready to give it all up to question the faith or something the bell rings and he's like he would sort of lean in you know like the old you know tune in next time when we <laughs> it's like it's a cliffhanger you know <laughs> in the classroom yeah. but but he would in the sermon in the sermon in one of his sermons i know several of his sermons pretty well and one of them particularly there's a couple of them that that really influenced me but one of them i adapted it's my own but it's on David's sinful census. And I heard mm, it. I don't know mm. if you ever heard his sermon on David's sinful census. And it's got a real sense of drama, the way mm, he, you know, because mm. what, what was David's sin here? And he, of course, the commentators have a field day psychologizing yeah, that text. Yeah. But he shows you how, if you understand the, the historical development, there is an answer here. David has Israel, it, the census is, is preparatory for war, right? Mm. Israel has achieved her biblical boundaries. Mm. She has no call. And this is why Joab, of all people, Joab yeah. would as soon chop somebody up yeah. as look at them. Exactly. Doesn't want to do this. And David, no, 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 no. I mean, it's like, what is he become a peacenik? He's picking <laughs> daisies and singing, give peace a chance. I mean, Joab, what's happened here? And But the reason why is that he has what God has, hmm. since back with Genesis 15, yeah. you know, with, with Abraham. And he told him, I'll give you the lands of all these people. And right. they were, David had achieved that. This is late in his reign, yep. but he's still, it's still not enough. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and of course he, then he, Jesus gave up everything so that we might, I mean, but he just, he, he, you know, I, you can't re-preach. You can't give in this little description, the yep. impact mm-hmm. of a good preachment, but he does it beautifully. And he did that, and he has a a, a Monday Thursday sermon hmm. called "A Cup of Sour Wine," hmm. that I I might just cry in describing it. It's hmm. just, but he was so, but he's giving you the meaning of the text. Yeah. It is all about the text, but he's letting there be a certain drama there. Yeah. And in other words, he's not up front saying, "Here's the theme, here are the points," and the way he's able to do it, it's more effective. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's useful for all of us, all the preachers. So there's and not just one way. No, there, there, yeah. I mean we need to preach God's word, but we don't. The Bible itself doesn't say, and here's precisely how you do it. Yeah, yeah it didn't come with a word document <laughs> template that uh, we it's plug not, in. It's not formulaic. <laughs> no, right, that's no. the problem. When yeah. you but fall the thing is, that. I mean, you know, because I remember somebody said who heard him, and they're like, "Well, is is that the method you should use?" And I said, "Did he preach Sometimes, that text?" Yeah. No. Yes. I mean, is there, do you feel you know more about that text than you've ever known? Yes. Well, what's the question? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he did his job. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I was really, I was really captivated a number of years ago. And I was, I think I was listening through Spurgeon's autobiography. Mm-hmm. And the, the comment was made, and I forget who made this, that Spurgeon had all the gifts to be an actor on the stage. Mm. And he used those 
in his preaching, but not to such an extent that he crossed a line where it just became a performance right. of an actor. And it really made me think, you know, what what has God given me as uh, an embodied spirit, and how can I use all that's at my disposal to enhance the delivery of the Word of God, to draw God's people in, to capture their attention, to captivate their imagination, and to present it in a really persuasive and cogent way. And, you know, just standing up behind the pulpit and giving a dry academic discourse on doctrinal heads doesn't seem to do that. It seems that you need to be far more personal. But enough about our problems in the OP. <laughs> but, yeah, this is – we have yeah. to deal with this. Yeah. Yeah, the, 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 the person was the leading Shakespearean actor of his day. Okay, okay. And he would bring regularly with the, the Charles Haddon Spurgeon story, yeah. he would bring uh, his students hmm. uh, at least annually, biannually a lot of times, he would bring his top students hmm. to the Metropolitan Tabernacle, which was the church Spurgeon pastored, hmm. to hear Spurgeon. And he was hmm. not a believer. Hmm. And, and he brought them there. Because he said, this man has the most artful but natural delivery I have ever seen. And so he wanted his drama students yeah. to be able to be expressive and clear, but to be natural. Mm -hmm. Because, well, I mean, when you're in the theater, you don't want to be sitting there thinking, boy, is that guy's acting. You, you want to just yeah. be, you want to be absorbed in the role and you're not thinking about, you know, when you're, then later when you're asked, what about, oh yeah, that was amazing acting. But you're not thinking while you're watching it all the time. This is amazing acting. Yeah. This is amazing acting. You're into it. You're, yeah. you're, oh. you're in the role, you know. And, but yes, but then, so Spurgeon was, he was just such a, he was a master yeah. at, at his craft and knowing where the line is where you've gone from the natural use of your god-given abilities into an affected display right, right. to call attention to yourself exactly. Yeah. Exactly. i guess to wrap things together it's not important we've talked about only everything to, <laughs> yeah but i mean i think there's a there's a thread that goes through it because it's important to understand our history so that we may know where we're going and of course, that's all based upon Scripture and what God has revealed to us in the future that is foretold and promised unto us. But it's not enough just to recount these stories ourselves and to other people, but also really to live them and to have a passion for them, to be affected by them, and then to convey uh, those things to others in a, in a passionate, meaningful way that they too may be encouraged and, uh, and transformed, so to speak. It's a real winsome use right. of history. Mm -hmm. And it links us. We're in a very atomistic world. We're a world. We're in a world. This sounds like a movie trailer. In a world. <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're in a world in which we've never had yeah. so much occasion mm. for connection. Yeah. And we're more isolated yeah. than ever. So we're, right. we're, we're a world that think of social media. And you can be always connected to, I mean, we were talking about this like when I was a kid. We'd go out and ride bikes and we'd be gone all day. Our parents didn't know where we were. They knew in a general way where we were. And now parents go nuts if they can't get a hold of their kids on the cell phone at any moment. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's, it's a strange world. It's, it's hyper-connected and hyper-distended. And, and church history, it, it, people, what do people want? in our age they want it they want community yeah, yeah. a right understanding of church history relates you to the people you know now and those that have gone before it relates you not only to the church militant but to the church triumphant, triumphant. Yeah. and it gives you a sense it imbues you it, it gives you i mean i think like when we listen to a child's christmas in wales when you mm -hmm. the, the, there, there's a palpable connection and church you, you need in 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 coming to church. You need to not just think about we're we just made all this up. But I I glory at we say the Apostles' Creed. There's a, and believers have been saying this for centuries. You think about somebody 
six centuries ago. Maybe they said it in a different language, but this is a, they essentially said this. Ten centuries ago, they said this. I mean, where in the culture even are you going to find that? Yeah. Exactly. Where in the culture? So for people who long for this connectedness, here's connectedness. Yeah. You know, here's, sure. here's a real pastoral side of this. Um, reading about the experience of the French Huguenots in Calvin's day and, and in the years following Calvin, the amount of suffering that they experienced was extraordinary and the deprivation that they had to live with. And to know that we have brothers and sisters in the faith who have gone before us who have suffered far more than we have. And yet then as we maybe have experiences of suffering, there's a sense that we belong to a fellowship of suffering which is rooted in Christ and we share in the sufferings of Christ and we have brothers and sisters in previous generations and at different places in the world who are undergoing the same things that we're undergoing. And they would understand us as we understand them. And I think when there's suffering involved, you need a community that cares for you so that you can endure the suffering. And to study, you know, some of, like Fox's Book of Martyrs, that, that book had an enormous impact on me. Uh, in my early years of formation, to know that people lived and died for Christ in their day, it, it gives me something to be fuel for my Christian living. And as I go through suffering, to know I'm part of a bigger family and they understand. And that was why I think if, if you were there at the General Assembly, I think the highlight of it was that remarkable testimony I've never oh, yeah. heard anything quite like it yeah. of a brother from China who will go nameless. I know his name. I've been in correspondence with him, mm. but he will not be named here. And he talked about that the goal of the repressive government, the program is called Reduce Zero. Yeah. They intend to wipe Christianity out. And not only was what he said... It, I've never heard anything like it. No. It wasn't just, you know, we're not going to be wiped out. It, it was like we're God's victory. We're the light the world needs, and they cannot extinguish us. And it was, I mean, there was not a dry eye in the no. house, and it wasn't a rolling, it wasn't a rolling standing ovation. It was an immediate standing ovation. And I, you know, and I, he sent me, uh, uh, I have a copy of the actual speech. Oh, that he gave, okay. And it's amazing. Hmm. And I was at a church mission conference and I, I shared some of this. Um, but you talk about, I mean, that kind of connectedness. Hmm. And one of the joys, this is a great place to end, is he's a sixth generation Christian. Hmm. You recall hmm. that he said, because yeah. we tend to think all these yeah. people are recent Christians. So he's, his family had been Christian since the mid-19th century. And I went up to him and mm. talked, and I said, you know, this is how do you become, how did they become Christians? And he said, the missionaries. Well, who do you think, of course, trained the missionaries that went and gave the gospel to his family? Yeah. Yeah. Charles Hodge. Mm -hmm. Charles Hodge taught the missionary that came and preached the gospel of this man's family, and he stands before the General Assembly. I mean, here's history. Here's how it works in the Christian church. Yeah, yeah. yeah this, is, this is real life. Uh, and, yeah. and Chairman Mao and all that have followed him who have been saying we're going to stamp it out. Madam Mao in 1966 in the Cultural Revolution said Christianity would be gone within 10 years. And they're gone. The Maos are gone. And the Christian faith marches on in China. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah, well, embrace the the history, um, and, and all the listeners, of course, can can read and continue to to pass on the history. And we're all living history. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is good to remember that, rather than just have our days, you know, pass on before us without without contemplation or reflection. Uh, but all that is is uh, important to remember. Um, what uh, what this brother shared with us also that there's a there's not an open endedness to history. There's a there's a telos, there is a goal, mm. there is an end point at which uh, our Savior Jesus Christ will return and will we will be raised imperishable with Him and He will He will judge and uh, He will bring the consummation. So that's where we're going. 
uh, and come Lord quickly. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, point people to various places. Uh, you can, of course, check out the uh, Grace OPC Sheboygan. Is it Grace? O- What's the web- yeah, website? Grace OPC Sheboygan dot com. Dot com. Yeah. And do we know? Do you know the dates uh, for the next conference when Danny's coming out? It's the, the last weekend of, of October. October? For Take 2020. We'll, we'll try to uh, promote that and include uh, that in the calendar, so yep. to speak, and remind people uh, to come and visit Sheboygan. Uh, how far are we? We're the 45 minutes north of Milwaukee? Yeah, hour? about maybe an hour north yeah. of Milwaukee. Uh, bring your surfboards. <laughs> this is the surfing capital of the Midwest, <laughs> and October, November is the prime time to surf in Lake Michigan, but you better bring your wetsuit, too. I, I, uh, it's yeah, true. That's it's true. true. Um, you hear that, Eric Watkins? Eric yeah, Watkins. Eric, he can come. Here we have our- it truly is beautiful, though. Oh. I, I mean, honestly, eastern Wisconsin on, on the, the border or on, um, on the lake. Oh, it's, 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 it's amazing. And of course, our buddy, Alan Strange, who is uh, not only at Mid America Reform Seminary, but also at New uh, Covenant uh, Community Church in Joliet, a OPC congregation. He serves as associate pastor there, author of several fine books. Um, you can visit them online and find uh, Alan's um, biography and CV, I believe, at midamerica.edu. They've just done a recent uh, website refresh, so check it out. It looks good. I had nothing to do with it. That's why it looks good. (laughs) (laughs) It does. They did a fine job, thanks to the brothers there. And, of course, we're online at reformedforum.org. And if you're interested in Alan's addresses from the conference, the first two from Saturday, they have been recorded. Uh, video and audio, everything looked fine. Uh, I have it all, so as long as I don't lose all the files on the way home, uh, we'll, we'll have them and, and available and, and posted on the website as well, and I'll include links to those in this episode description. But thank you all so much for listening, and we hope you join us again next time on Christ the Center. <laughs>